Welcome everybody. Thursday afternoon. See some steaks in the chat. Happy Thursday, everyone. Good to have you back here. I know we have two in a week, but you know, when the value is there, the value is there. Today we have a very, very special guest that we've been trying to get on here for a while. Uh, he has a lot of very valuable information for us today regarding his past in business, the companies that he's grown, and we're going to dive more into who Taylor Welsh is specifically. We're also going to leave it open for Q&A. Um, so not only do we have questions prepared for him, um, but we'll also want to see what you you guys want to hear from him. So stick around uh, near the end. We're going to do more of a, a live Q&A. But without further ado, I just wanted to bring Taylor to the stage um, and then have him give himself a little introduction. Taylor, my man, thank awesome. you for coming out today. Appreciate you. Man, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. This is a cool, a cool intro you have. You got it nailed. I feel like I want a yeah. movie. <laughs> We like to hype things up a little bit, and, but we know you're going to provide the value anyways, though, so it's not fake yeah. hype. It'll, it'll be fun. Let's jam. Um, awesome. So as I mentioned uh, to you, this community is primarily uh, agency owners, so people that are either starting their agency off um, or they are further along in the in the development of their agency, maybe even looking to exit. So we have a wide range of of audience here. So feel free to share anything that you know inside of that realm. But we also just have general entrepreneurs in here, also from from Capital Club and from Agency Domain as well. Um, if you guys are watching from Capital Club feel free to drop in a little alien emoji for me. If you guys are watching from agency domain, let's see some stakes in the chat. If you guys are on your computer, just drop a one. Either way, we'll, we'll accept either one. Um, but Taylor, I think the first thing that for people that maybe don't know who you are, I think most do um, that are coming to watch you today. But for people that don't necessarily know who you are, I'd, I'd like to hear kind of me personally as well, hear a little intro of, of kind of your story and, and, and where you came from. Yeah, I um, I got started with uh, business in real estate. So in in two thousand and so in two thousand and twelve, I worked at a church. I was actually a pastor at a church. Two thousand in in oh, end wow. of two thousand twelve, two thousand thirteen, I transitioned from full time vocational ministry into real estate. So um, I honestly like did not have the story of of starting a business when I was a kid. I wasn't in yeah. the entrepreneurial space. Um, I had no idea that you could even really work for yourself. It never crossed my mind until um, <laughs> you know, I met my now wife. She was a, an entrepreneur. And I was like, you know, what is that? That sounds back in the day, man, like entrepreneur wasn't like cool. It's not it wasn't like a, a thing. Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk came and made everybody want to be an entrepreneur. But before then, it was kind of like, you know, um, my dad was a, a VP of sales at, in, at an insurance company. And I was like, you know, I just. Uh -huh. I'm just going to grow up and, and be like my dad. Um, so once I met my wife, Lindsay, we got married. Uh, we got married while I was on staff at the church. We were so poor. It was, it's painful to even talk about how broke we were, uh, well beneath the poverty line. And I was like, you know, I got to figure something out to make money. So I got a job from a friend of mine at a real estate firm. And uh, I inherited 6,000 single family residential properties. Uh, and I had to learn on the job how to manage those properties. That's a lot of maintenance requests. That's a lot of broken toilets. That's a lot of that's a lot of nasty. Um, yeah. So people are. I like to tell people that I got started in real estate, but it wasn't really real estate. It was like a repairman job, glorified plumber. <laughs> yeah. And so, but I learned sales at the property management firm because if you can convince someone to to pay their rent when you haven't fixed their toilet. And this is just the thing, like, you know, people will come in, they would be like, I'll pay rent if uh, if you fix my my blinds. <laughs> be like, well, okay, yeah, we'll fix your blinds. And it, we'll it's try to deal. get them to pay. <laughs> good deal, right? Um, and, you know, but there's processes where you got that many houses. You can't fix everything, not at the same time. Some things are covered, some things are not. So I was responsible for signing tenants, renewing tenants, 
And uh, dude, my secret was I would just figure things out. People would, ask, my boss would ask me to do something, I would do it. I'm taking the long way home to kind of show share how I got to where I'm at. Um, I learned marketing yeah, with the it. tool HubSpot back in the back in the day. HubSpot was a HTML CSS processor for like blog content. It wasn't marketing automation like it is today. And I just learned it. Um, my manager had asked me if I could do newsletters. I said, I know how to do newsletters. I had never sent a newsletter in my life. I was like, I'll figure it out, you know. Um, then they needed copy. I said, I can write copy. And through a series of events, I just started learning and self-training and self-teaching. I was putting myself through college at night. We all have this story, right? Like we, we go through this period where you have to become obsessed and you gotta be obsessed for a year or two years or three years. And then you never, rec you don't recognize yourself. And that was 2013, 2014 for me. I got good at copy because I, because I wrote so many pages by hand and started learning media. And man, one day I just, I literally woke up and I was like, I think I'm going to do this for another client besides the real estate firm. So I put it online. Um, we can go into that later if you want. It was an embarrassing ordeal, but I did get a client from it. And that one client paid me more than my full-time real estate gig was paying me. Oh, there and you I go. Was like, I was like, what am, what am I doing? You know, I'm just going <laughs> to. Why am I doing this real estate gig? I, I hate real estate. I was like, I hate property management. This is the worst thing in the world. But I stayed for another four or five months because here was my logic. I was like, I can use the real estate income, my W-2 income to pay for courses and coaches and mentors. So I did. I stayed for another five or six months. And um, then one day I was just like, you know, it makes zero sense. I'm doubling my income on weekends. And so I've got to. I've got to give it a go and see what we can do. And so it's April of 2015, transitioned from property management full time into um, copywriting. So that's kind of how I got my feet wet at the beginning. And one of the questions was, uh, so this one's specifically from church to real estate, but when was, what age were you at that time? So this has been, deal. yeah, so I'm 34 right now and it's 2000 and. 24 that would have so been, been like 2012 23 yeah something like that yeah so what was it 14 years yeah 21 22 21, okay yeah very cool and the, the cool thing about the cool thing about church life is um i was still able to be a part i actually goof around about it today because i still know all of those guys and my wife and i were still super plugged into our church here in nashville this was in memphis so we used to live in memphis um, oh, okay. But I I joke around because I was like I basically took a promotion, <laughs> I was promoted to volunteer because sometimes volunteers like you just you get paid more for being there for free. I mean, these were brutal hours. We were I would clock ninety hours a week, and so when I got into the corporate scene, I was just like, "Is this it? Like forty hours, and I need to fill that up." So I I immediately like enrolled re enrolled in college. I was working full time back in college. I started training myself on media and copywriting because to me, I was I had I had normalized it like 80, 90 hours a week. And I was like, I just I'm bored now and need to figure something else to do. I think it broke up a little bit. I think it's my internet though. I don't think it's you. Um uh so then you went from so you went from doing that and and trying to get clients and spending the extra is that something that you would still consider to be like one of the things that I always look back and uh, at my past and I'm like okay well that maybe wasn't a wise move but it made me the person I am today right like it made me into the person that I am today the reason that I am who I am but would you still consider like your past moves like whether they were lateral or whatever to be the wisest decision for for your progress or like as far as doing it on the weekend while still maintaining a job yeah i think it was i think it's the best move because right now there's this thing where people want so badly to be entrepreneurs and they want so badly to be full-time and i don't this may be a deviation from the audience who we're talking to but at least for on my end you know we have hundreds of thousands of people that come in um like buying products, reading books, newsletters, asking for phone calls. And one of the things that I notice is people just 
people try to move too soon. Um, they're quitting their jobs too soon. And it's like, look, I would, I would far rather have a stream of income that I can just devote into resourcing my education. You know, I think it's, I, I, I didn't get into the stock market. I didn't start buying real estate. I just started buying education. And the way that mm -hmm. I did that was with my, with, with my W2 job. So I think it was the right move. I would still recommend that move today. But then there comes a point where you've got to compare opportunity costs. P&Ls and financial statements and income statements and like they don't uh, they don't show you the opportunity cost of your energy. So at a certain point, you're like, well, I can make ten dollars doing this and being exhausted or I can make one hundred dollars doing this and it's easy. You have uh -huh. to pick. And that's I crossed that bridge in 2015. And that's when you're like, this is this is the time where I where I go, where I go all in. Yeah, 100 percent. But it still happens like even today. I was having a convo this morning with one of our marketing uh, crews and it was just like, you know, why would we put uh, time and effort into this thing um, when we can put time and effort into this thing over here? And it's it's not only easier for us because when you have tailwinds, um, when you have tailwind, everything improves and everything gets easier. So it's mm -hmm. a skill set I think to determine which things have tailwind and which things am I just trying to trying to fix because I'm used to them working and they're not working so opportunity cost hits us all all places of the game and so when you decided to go full on into the thing that was working for you uh how did you kind of like realize like wow this is um this is actually like going to the next level like it's not just something that's providing money for my family anymore this is actually something where i can actually generate real wealth and what made you pick that rather than just sticking with like, uh, well, I'm making enough and then I can spend the rest of my time volunteering at church. Yeah. Well, I don't think I recognized it as an opportunity till, um, till we started hiring staff and seven, six or seven months after I went full time, we started, um, traffic and funnels, which was the big consultancy that mm -hmm. took off from 2015 to, uh, 2022. So that's how, that's kind of how I, I didn't realize that this was a legitimate vehicle for equity value or, or m multiplying net worth until like 2018. It was late. Mm -hmm. um, originally, man, the decision was just like, well, and this sounds silly, but it's true. I was like, you know, we can go out and eat once a week at the real estate firm. We can go out and we can go out and eat five times a week if I make five times as much money. It was very basic. Like, you know, my, my opportunity cost is like, I wasn't thinking through it from like a, an actual inner, like enterprise empire standpoint. I was just like, why would I work 40 hours a week for this when I can work 40 hours a week for that? And if my, if my hourly rate holds, I'm going to make five times as much money. Um, once we started hiring other people and I tasted leverage, then it was like, oh, this is this is what I want to do, like with my life, because traffic mm -hmm. and funnels was only supposed to be like a two to three year thing. It wasn't I never I didn't start traffic and funnels with the intention of building this massive thing and selling it. I started mm -hmm. it because I was being begged to for, to teach like how I built a waiting list. Have you heard the story? Like, I don't it might be helpful to share like how we started that. Yeah, beginning. absolutely. Let's jump into it. So I had a waiting list in um, June of 2015. And I'd only been like, I'd only been full time for two or three months. I'd been writing copy for about eight months, seven or eight months. And I had a waiting list from from June of 2015 into the spring of 20, uh, 2016. And um, someone found out about it, a crew, uh, uh, somebody on Ryan Levesque's team, we were talking, mm -hmm. this is when Ask Method was just getting hot and quiz funnels were kind of, you know, survey funnels is what they called them. And they found yeah. out that I had a waiting list and they were like, I don't believe you. And I was like, it's definitely true. Um, <laughs> I've got a waiting list and people are sending me PayPal's for like the whole thing. And uh, he was like, have, can you teach me how to do it? I was like, yeah, I'm just sending them this letter. And it was like a, it was basically a sales letter that was just framing me as a legitimate service provider, telling them how busy I was. It was basics now. Um, and I said, I'm sending them this letter. And if they want to engage, they engage. And I had like a, a biotech company. I had a paid ads company. I had like four or five people that had 
paid me six months, seven months in advance. And um, then he told someone, then they told somebody. And then the, by the time we hit the, the fall of 2015, I had just my messenger inbox. I was posting to get done for you clients, like service clients. Uh -huh. But my messenger convos were just people wanting me to teach them how to build waiting lists. They were their own service providers. It was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll teach you how to do that. And, you know, I had a photographer. One of the first clients we had was a photographer. They're like, how do I build a waiting list? And I was like, I'll teach you how to do it. 2,500 bucks, bam. And I got paid 2,500 bucks. And I remember being like, I'm used to getting, I'm used to getting 10, 15, 20 K for, you know, like a 30 day, 20, a 45 day, like a extensive laborious, like write a bunch of sales copy right. for them. And I just got paid like $2,500 for nothing. For like an hour's work. <laughs> yeah, like I was, I'm going to record a video. And then another person they weren't a photography. I think they were like a gym or something. They paid twenty five hundred dollars. I was like, I just got paid for nothing because I already made it for the previous client. Uh huh. And I was like, okay, well, something's got it. I had that second thing where I was like, why would I do work for people when I can just teach them? Mm -hmm. And it's good stuff. And that's kind of like how the catalyst of like consulting for me started. Like, and that was back in the day, man. Like Sam Ovens. I paid Sam Ovens because, and Sam was in my messenger inbox. I thought he wanted to pay me to learn how to build a waiting list. And I got on a call with him because he was like, hey, how are you doing this? And he flipped it and enrolled me for 5K into something. And I don't even remember what it was. Um, but, you know, Classic. Sam did He was just a baby. Back. We were all babies. Like, this is 2015. He didn't have a program. He had a Dropbox link. So he sent me a Dropbox link. And I was like, cool, bro. This is awesome. Like. It's just Sam with a, with like a screen recording in Dropbox. And that was such like a, a fun time because nobody had invented anything yet. And everyone was sort of yeah. trying to figure out how everything works. And ultimately, like what happened is like the market just consolidated everything. So like a little bit of my stuff, Sam stuff, Rufino stuff, it all kind of got put into like this super program and everybody, everybody kind of took pieces of it. Um, but when we started hiring teams, sales became a really big deal. And the sales teams that, that I built were, uh, were monsters and they were, you know, they ended up being so effective. I got in trouble for them later by regulatory agencies. But the, the point is the, the way our culture was set up, it grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And it just became something like three years came and went. And I was like, I can't leave now because we have, you know, we have 2000 clients and it's huge. And yeah. it's just, it came one of those, I was like, I just need to see it through. Um, but my intentions were never that my intentions were at the beginning. I was just like, I'm just going to get paid and, and, yeah. uh, and not have to work for pennies on, at church. And that was my mission. You know, <laughs> it's kind of yeah. embarrassing, but no, no, no. It, it makes sense. It makes sense. I, I, People here know my story, but I come from the nonprofit world. I worked in nonprofit before I started my business. And so it was the same kind of deal of like, hey, I wanted to earn money so that I could then go do with what I wanted to, building my own nonprofits or et cetera, with the money I was making. So I was just curious how that process was for you. Mine was like very clear because I was 27 when I decided to do it. So I was a lot older, um, yeah. but I was just curious about that. Um, how old are you now? I'm 20. I'm 30. So it was just three years ago. Okay. Nice. It's yeah. 20. I was like, bro, how do you figure that out? You're aging in reverse here. <laughs> no, no, I'm 30. Uh, I was going to say 29, but I just turned 30. That's why. Um, and what Happy do you birthday. think is one of the uh, Exxon asks, not affiliated with X, oh, Exxon. Uh, he asked, what is one of the biggest risks that you took in your business? Or maybe in that begin in those beginning stages, what do you think was that the biggest risk? Um, the biggest risk at the time, I'll, I'll give you two answers for that. Cause I think that there's always, there's the biggest risk at the time, like what it felt like in the moment. And then in hindsight, um, the biggest risk at the time was, was probably our first hire. We hired a, we hired a media buyer because my partner was running all of the ads at the beginning, but you know, I, I knew from reading and study, like you can't, you can't scale past your own energy re reserves. Like you can't out scale your time and your energy. So I was like, we need to figure out team. So when you when you go from being responsible for yourself to being responsible for another person's family, I think that that always feels like 
at least if you're not a psychopath, it feels like a big deal. Yeah. Um, and it felt like a big deal for me. I was like, I need now I, I could be the you know, the the linchpin to someone else being able to survive. And then also from there is like we we took a lot of risk early on because we we could. And this business usually have high profit compared to other vehicles. And when I moved to Nashville, we we picked up offices and we had 15, 16,000 square feet here in Nashville that we put people in. So there were a lot of little micro risks along the way. In hindsight, definitely the biggest risk that, that I took was going all in from um, when traffic and funnels started. Going all in on that was a huge risk. When sales mentor started, we went all in on sales mentor. So you can see throughout the past couple of years, like there was almost an all or nothing approach that still I'd still have to an extent. Um, and that's that's always risky when you when you have this drive to be 100 rather than have like some people I really respect who seem to be able to um, they, they seem to be able to run like multiple things at the same time. And I tend to bounce around between mm -hmm. different things. Like I don't, I can't run multiple things at the same time. I, I'm a hundred percent at whatever is happening, but I tend to get bored really, really fast. Yeah. Um, and so I think that 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 was a risk in hindsight. We could have diversified better. One of the things that you uh, mentioned earlier on was you like to go after the things that you have good tailwind or good momentum with. Um, one of the questions that I have is. When do you decide when a certain, you know, offer or service or even entire company is kind of plateaued and you're like, hey, this why we're we're beating a dead horse right now. It's not going anywhere. And we need to pivot to another offer. Like, how do you how do you decide that for yourself? And and is that even something in your mind? Or do you just say, like, oh, everything has a solution? No, I think I think there are times when you have to do that. Um but I think you want to make that decision before that decision it, it actually is forced upon you. So like when an offer loses its steam, that's the you're kind of behind the eight ball at that point if that's the if that's when you cut bait. So like Jim Collins mm -hmm. has this this idea of small bullets and how even the bigger, like massive companies, they're they've got their cannons and they've got their small bullets. So a cannon would be something that's like it's scaled up, it's huge. It's super profitable. Like the iPhone is a Canon. Um, you know, like different companies have different things. Client Kit was a Canon product for TF. And then we you have small bullets, which are just these little tests. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. But when they work, you put all of your resources behind it and you scale it up. Um, so the how do you decide when an offer is kind of past this point of of like it's it's kind of declining, it's got diminishing returns. I think that that mm -hmm. really comes down to um, what else do you have going and what are you comparing it to? Because it's relative. So when when we've got like when we've got a book that's working and then I write a new book and that new book has half the acquisition costs and triple the LTV on the back. At that point, the the previous book, I don't I'm not interested in scaling that I want to scale the one that that I can feel the market rallying behind. The right. problem is if don't have multiple small bullets in the market you, you'll never know like what's actually wanted and what's working so you have to test right it. yeah that Does makes that make sense? sense yeah yeah no absolutely um yeah i just think it's it's one of those things where people get so emotionally attached to offers yep. especially if it's like one of their first one they're like oh well this is the one that's been doing it for me forever and then they're just like, okay, well, it's because I haven't been able to figure out a solution for it yet. It's not because people don't want the offer anymore. Um, and I feel like yeah. that's something that people deal with during those times of like, oh, dang, I don't know. I, I don't know how to get rid of this offer and find something new. Or they're scared to go to something else, especially if it's their, their first thing. They're like, well, this was just my one thing, you know? Yeah, it's like uh, evolution is always, it's always trying to kill off itself. Mm-hmm. It just wants the next thing before it does so. It's like there's a reason that that leaves fall off in the winter and come back more vibrant in the spring. Like we're we're always going through the same process of like how do I how do I beat something old with something new? And I think companies that lose that are are usually they're they're either entitled they've become entitled to being at the top or 
uh, they've just lost energy. And so they're on the decline because of that, which is another piece of like, you can study Jim Collins on how the mighty fall. And he'll take you through that of like, when, whenever a company stops inventing or enhancing what they're, they're, they're doing, they're ripe for market takeover and, and they'll be disrupted. Mm -hmm. One of the questions from, from S is how do you deal with difficult times in business? It's a very general question, but you can take it where you'd like. Yeah, I, was, I would say every time in business is difficult and it should be difficult if you're growing. Like the difficulty of business is most often when you expected it not to be difficult. That's when you're, the, it, when we want it to be easy or we begin to crave um, the easy path, I think that's when we're susceptible to feeling this, you know, this fatigue. So how do I deal, how do you deal when this, how do you, how do you deal with the fact that the sun comes up in the morning? This is a, a I'm giving an obtuse answer on purpose and we can dive into mm -hmm. it, but how do you deal with the fact that it's like, it's cold outside, but like you just, mm -hmm. you have to respond to the elements in a way that keeps you alive. And so um, it's, it's, there's no better period for growth than when there's, when you're surrounded by difficulty, it just should all, it, that's the way that it will always be. So how do you deal with it? You just, you just keep going. And if you fail, you fail, um, but you're not going to die. And as long as you don't die, you become smarter through the difficult moments. And nobody likes to hear that, but it's the truth. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, one of the things that uh, we want to talk about today, obviously, was you, you, how you've exited a, a fair bit of companies as well, correct? I've exited a lot of real estate. I actually have not oh, okay. sold... I haven't sold any companies. I have given companies away. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. And what was what do you think the reason for that being would be is that you do, you wouldn't prepare those to to sell? Just I'm just curious in general, like why why isn't that something that you pursued? So I've only had we have traffic and funnels, salesman, Thorm, intelligent advertiser, um, wealth gap, market movers, levels of wealth, and that was those are my that was the extent of my previous portfolio so traffic and funnels and sales mentor i i just i gave them away and um levels of wealth i shut down which is was in hindsight all of these happened because of partnership issues and it wasn't worth like i didn't want to go through the the you know the ups and downs of like messing with that um market movers was shut down again for a partnership issue so it wasn't that they weren't um prepared to be able to sell they had enterprise value they had customer value one of the lists one of the lists was two million names and uh hundred thousand plus customers but mm -hmm. i think what i lacked at the beginning people don't understand this like you know i don't have the experience of saying like well i started my first business and it failed and then I got a second chance. Now, my first business was traffic and funnels. Yeah. The very first one. So I had no experience. Like I had no idea. Like, how do you how do you set up a you know an operating agreement so that you have control over the partnership? I don't know. How do you set up buy-sell policies so that you can get in and out of partnerships? What's phantom versus real equity and what stockholder programs look like? And so there was no like it was it was me outside of the church world starting a business, and I didn't know how yeah. to do it. Now, when you look like across things, you have wealthy consultant and um, Femi and, and a sales uh, staffing company. Uh, there's there's different brands now, and all of my equity agreements are fairly airtight. Like I know how it works. They're all backed by pre, you know permanent insurance. It's like it's a different world. Yeah. So that you ask the question like, why weren't they prepped the right way? I've because I started them basically out of college. You know, I didn't yeah. have any idea. I mean, maybe not prep the right way but like i feel like a lot of people go into this game especially i think i maybe it's more in like the e-commerce world it's also in the agency world though i've seen it also where people like go into it and they're like their end all get all is like i'm gonna i'm gonna grow this so big and then i'm gonna sell like that's sell it, yeah. like that's my end goal you know so that's what i was just yeah. curious is why wasn't that like your your end goal of like i'm gonna maybe maybe not in your first one but in your other ones but like hey i'm gonna grow this and then i'm gonna sell it yeah it just, it wasn't, it never even crossed my mind. I mean, it sounds so funny now because with the, with the companies now, like, yeah, they're all set up so we could, I could sell all or part of them. 
Um, but it literally never crossed my mind. And TF went from zero to zero to 12 million a year in two and a half years. And at the time, that was pretty fast. Like now, when you look at like Cole Gordon, who came from TF, and, um, uh, you know, Ashton, who came from TF, like these guys yeah. are just insane. Like I look at how fast they grow things. I'm like, yo, props to you because, um, you, you Ashes, you take somebody from zero to a million a month in four days. But at the time, TF was like the fastest that we had ever experienced. And I think in hindsight, if I would have been growing a little bit slower, I would have figured it out. But interesting, an interesting note on this, like I was talking with a buddy of mine in that period where I was like giving things away. And there were some things that I knew needed to be fixed. Like I needed to go in and, and reduce concentration risk because a lot of the products had my face and IP in them. I needed to like, like fix yeah. some of the sales stuff. And I was talking with a very, very successful and now quite popular entrepreneur who's one of the best. Uh, he, he runs a big holding company. And he, he actually was just like, you know, I had to go back in and I had to fix different things in the company that I, that I was prepping to sell. And I hated every moment of it. He's like, when your heart's done, your heart's done. He's like, somebody like you, if you can focus on what you're passionate about, then just do it and everyone will stay out of your way. He's like, I don't know that I would go prep it again. And for me, I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to waste the time trying to go in and build something to, to exit. Because mm -hmm. when you build something to exit, it's just like to somebody like me and probably probably like you and probably a lot of the audience, like marketing and growth and advertising, like we can grow things anytime we want to grow them. So it's almost just an it's just a feather in the cap. And I just wasn't willing to pay for that feather. I was like, forget mm -hmm. that. I'm gonna have some fun and and take a break. So he influenced my decision a little bit as well. I like that. No, I just I like that perspective because I've I feel like people get caught up in that a lot of like, hey, this is why we're doing it. And it isn't always the the end all get all. It isn't always the best answer. Well, yeah, who who do you really look up to? like big, big entrepreneurs that have changed, like people will remember them, books are written about them. Who are their names? For me? Yeah. Entrepreneurs that I look up to? Um, I don't know, big there's people ones. that have big biography, ones. Biography worthy. Biography worthy. Um. I mean, there's there's like the the popular ones like Steve Jobs and stuff like that have just created huge tech companies and yeah. you know Bill Gates and I don't know if there's any of one that I truly like look up to of like hey this is this is what I want to model my life. Obviously, there's people in the in the past as well of like rulers and different things like that. People in the Bible for sure, but yeah. um, but currently I don't know if there's anyone that I could say like hey this is who I truly most of my people that I that I follow or or look up to are people that are still active, maybe not necessarily uh, biography worthy, but yeah, some of them like would be. Elon, Elon, Bezos. Yeah, e Elon would be one. Be oh, Bezos for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what's interesting about these guys is we don't find a we don't find any written documentation from them being like, I'm going to build Amazon really big so I can sell it. Yeah. And Elon doesn't want to build Tesla so he can sell it. And Jobs never wanted to build Apple so he could sell it. So there's this there's this weird disconnect in dichotomy between like, okay, if you're just building something to sell it, I understand that. You know, no judgment, no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. However, the the potency of something that you can build when you actually give a shit about the building of the thing mm -hmm. almost can almost contradicts or conflicts with the very idea of like i'm just going to build it big so i can get rid of it for a payday and so yeah. i would i think that that's part of it too like if the 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 hedge fund guys they don't want to sell anything ever they're wanting to buy and they're not yeah. wanting to sell them so i think that that's it's it's an interesting discussion at the very least there's no right or wrong answer um but the players usually we're building things that we want to build and we really like them and so that's part of why it never crossed my mind either at the beginning. I was like, why would I sell traffic? But somebody tried to get me to sell traffic and funnels in 2020. I was like, are you stupid? No, never. Like, I get to do events and stuff and write books. And what's funny is at the time, because of how traffic and funnels was running at the time, it was a, you know two years before, like we had tons of staff. Um, I, I could have sold it probably for 25 million bucks easily. 
um, because it was still fresh. And I was just like, nah. In hindsight, maybe I should have, maybe I should have like at least explored it. But you know, you live and you learn. Yeah, it's one of those like it's one of those things like if you're building a house for your family, your your family's dream house, you're not thinking about, man, I'm gonna make this so good so that later I can sell it when we don't want it, right? Like you're thinking you about think like this yeah. is my my family's gonna live in this forever. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. Startup advice for 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 Basim. He's saying, what's the best way to define a unique value proposition? The the most like uh, tactical way is if you have a selection on market or um, like industry at the very least, just go find what everybody's doing and and overlay them and cross examine them and find out what's not there. Um, that's the easiest way if you want to actually dovetail in with the blue ocean type of approach, blue ocean strategy approach. Mm -hmm. The other thing about USP is like, it's really hard to clone. Uh, it's really hard to clone energy. And the reason I say that is because if, if you, once again, let's bring up Elon, like what's the USP of, of what's the USP of Tesla, the car company versus what's the USP of Tesla, the brand mm -hmm. and the USP of Tesla, the brand is Elon Musk period. Yeah. Um, but when you look at the car company, you know, the, the way that they go and tinker with the product and um, actually look at everything is they're just looking at what's the coolest, funnest, most, you know, excitable thing that we can put into these vehicles. And I would say that the definition, if you ask Elon, because he's been interviewed on this, if you ask him, like, if if he were to have to answer the USP of Tesla, it would probably be like fun <laughs> because that's how he designs the cars. That's how his brain yeah. thinks. He's like, well, I just, I just decided what I wanted, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's like the funnest thing in the world is getting into a Model S Plaid. Like, you know. um, so, but for business, we do have a lot, an element of, of especially service providers. What's this person, that person, that person, that person doing? And then what are they not doing? And the USP usually can fit really nicely inside of like what's missing from the market. And if it's missing because they're, the competition doesn't want to do them, that's fine. If it's missing because the competition can't do them, that's golden. So that's the holy grail mm -hmm. is to figure out the things that are missing because nobody else knows how to do it. The the more crowded the market is, the more hard, the, the difficulty increases. Um, so there's something to be said to in niching down. That'll help you with your USP as well. I hope that helps. That, yeah, no, absolutely. That That's curious, actually, because one of the things that I've seen more recently um inside of like the the lead gen range of people doing like local lead gen for businesses whether it's dentists cosmetics whoever it is um is that the offers that or the people that that's agencies i've seen grown the grow the quickest this past year um have been the ones that have that haven't charged retainers up front and and people always say like in the agency space like oh you got to just charge up front do your work they just have to trust you whatever but with the yeah. in the lead gen space, since there's so many of them, I've seen people actually go out and be like, hey, you're just going to pay me by lead. And then they've made tons of money because they trust that they can actually do it. Whereas people are, that are selling them a retainer are like, well, it's it's you kind of don't give them the certainty that you're going to get them those results. And I, I thought that's curious because that's kind of linked to what you're saying is they're they're going out and offering things that other people can't really because they're scared to. Yeah, I mean that's big. That's a that would be a pricing, a pricing distinction. You know, even if you look at some of the people right now who are really, really big, they give a lot of stuff away for free. Well, that's mm -hmm. a pricing model. You know, giving something for free is a form of pricing, and it's something yeah. most people don't want to mess with. So, yeah, absolutely. Speaking of free, uh, Michael had a question. He said, "In today's world, with a crazy amount of free resources available." Sure. What would you do if you started from zero in today's world? I would probably write a book and charge money for it. Just a book at the out the gate. Like if yeah. you were in the same position of like, hey, I'm working in a church looking to try and make some side money or whatever, get into this entrepreneur game. Yeah, because the reason I say that is because I think there um so we teach this inside of inside of one of our firms. Just they call it the Codex. And there's different. There's attention. There's demonstration. There's monetization. So when you have um, a, attention at the top, what you're trying to do is two things: purchase the attention of the market, and then retain the attention of the market. If you can, if you can show somebody that you're worth paying attention to, they'll come back. 
and they'll follow you mm -hmm. for, for a long time. But underneath that, you have demonstration. And demonstration is where you basically go from trying to get somebody to pay attention to you to then trying to get them to uh, pay you money in, in a way that you can prove that you're good at what you do. So a VSL will be a direct offer. A webinar will be a direct offer. A book would be a form of demonstration. Events, communities, these different things are, are demonstration assets. And then monetization at the bottom. The reason I would say I would write a book is because writing a book is in the middle from top to bottom, and it's in the middle from left to right. So you can charge money for it. When people read a book, they're spending time with you. A book and a podcast and a newsletter, those three things as a trio are, are wild, wild effective because people get to read you in long form. They get to read you in short form and they get to listen to you. So you're mixing you're mixing mediums on how someone consumes and you're mixing timelines. I, if I were starting today um, and I wrote a book that was 70 pages long, you put that thing up on Amazon, you start selling it you advertise a podcast in the middle of the book and all of a sudden you just have a legion source coming in for nothing. You know, you can mm -hmm. liquidate on, on Amazon overnight. Right. And what is, what is the process that you generally go about? You said, you said, then you advertise the book. What's the process that you generally do for advertising the book, like going to events, actually running ads for it, or, or what's the process you, you would go through? Amazon. Maybe not now because you can, you can do it all, but. Yeah, Amazon ads. I mean, Amazon ads are, are the cheapest. Like, you can, you can, have you done Amazon ads yet? Yeah. Well, I mean, I have an Amazon agency, so we've run it for e oh, yeah. brands, but. So our, our book CPAs right now are like four to $6 per book per, wow. per sale. Um, so yeah. And if the book is good, then you have your own distribution channel built into the customer base because then they're, sharing the book with other people uh the hard part is writing a good book so like yeah <laughs> you know what the question was a little was like what would you do uh i would write a book but if if it was like what's the fastest path the answer changes like you put a vsl put it online yeah that's probably the fastest path but the best path is to get a really good quality piece of information and make it able to charge money for it i like that uh, Jake has a similar question to me, but I'll just I'll just quote his. Uh, when you went from church to millionaire, how did it affect you? Your, your thought about uh, well, I'm reading it wrong. How did it affect how you thought about your mission in life? You no, know, make, he makes it sound like I went from the church to the millionaire, like they're different uh, destinations or different places. Um, I'm still at church as a millionaire, just for the record. But money, money, um, money changes the Christian dynamic of dependence on God. And that was my biggest struggle um, is you have all of these different things. And this is like, I don't know what your audience believes, but I'll just answer the question the best I know how. But like mm -hmm. the when you actually study scripture, it's like, you know, there is great novelty and great strength in dependence. And when you're rich, you don't feel like you have to have God quite as much. Like the dependence on God went away. And so I had to learn how to not let my money become an idol because it's mm -hmm. very easy for money to be, it's a piece of idolatry. Um, and it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't even matter. Like this applies to whether you're Muslim or buddhist or whatever there's something healthy about the human spirit having being in need and yeah. eating someone or something else and so i had to go through a process where you know uh money was reclassified as a tool not a, a not a stability a source of of protection or a source of security and yeah. now when i when i look at money or accounts or businesses you know, I really am asking the question, like, what does obedience look like right now for this? Like, what does obedience look like with this money? Um, and sometimes that's to, you know, sometimes it shows up as like, let's pay for someone's dinner. Sometimes it's like, let's donate to this orphanage. Sometimes it's like, let's give 15% instead of 10 with the tithe. Like, I think that having a relationship with God means you're always asking that question. Like, what, what do you want me to do with this? And there's a, there's a form of power that comes with that as well. I don't know if that answers the mm -hmm. question, but. 
comes to mind. No, yeah, absolutely. What are kind of the parameters that you put in place? Just, I mean, obviously a lot of the people here, they believe all different things. But um, I think one of the things that you said, it's one of the things that I preach a lot is that is money just a tool. And if you don't use it or view it as a tool, then it's going to elude you, right? Like, because money is, that's why money was created in the beginning. It was like, hey, and I owe you because you gave me a toothbrush. So now I owe you something, right? It was always a tool at the beginning, but people view it as like this end all get all of like, man, I just need a million in my bank account. And that's like one of the worst things you can, you can hope to pursue. Um, so what's kind of like the parameters that you put, uh, whether it was faith driven or just personal driven of being able to have a good mentality on money for like those, that first million or that first taste of like, oh, wow, I'm actually making good money now. That's far exceeding just my basic needs. Yeah. Great question. Are you able to see chat? Like if I ask a question and people answer, are you able to see that? Yeah, yeah, you can too. So the, the tab on the top right that says comments. Oh, hey, there we go. How many of you? Have, <laughs> how many? Of you, how many of you have ever felt like poor, even though you know you're not? Like yes, no, maybe so, and like legit, like you just wake up feeling scarcity. Even if you had a good month, a, a good year, whatever, for some reason you have this feeling of like. I'm not where I want to be and maybe I don't have enough. So the reason I'm going to answer this question, but the reason, by the way, I didn't even know I could see comments. This is a game changer, by the way. Thank <laughs> You're you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so scarcity is a spirit. No matter how you define it, like it's a spirit and it, it, it's, it's an energy. It moves through energy and it moves through kinetics and it moves through people. And so one of the one of the easiest ways to combat this, because if you're honest, everyone has felt this. Everyone's had those moments where they feel like I, I don't have enough. Like I need more. I need more. I need more. Or like what if what if what if this doesn't work out? Fear. It's just fear and scarcity. It's the the negativity. If you were able to go and give money to someone who has less money than you, you will break this spirit. And giving is a giving generosity is is an offensive warring spirit. So it has generosity benefits the giver. And so this is my challenge is like one of my rules is when I am feeling like I, you know, maybe money has become a thing that I'm too focused on or I'm too worried about it. You know, generosity has a way of have resetting and the repolarizing this in a person's life. I'm obviously though, like I want to have my family taken care of. So I think that giving all of your money away and then all of a sudden your kids are eating out of trash cans, that's bad stewardship. That, that's not what I'm recommending. So I want I want a minimum of of like this is worst case scenario. I want six months of of operating capital in the bank. Six months feels good for me. Um, I want my assets to I want to have like constant money going into my assets. And the way that we set that up is we just set a percentage of income that are going into assets. And right now, to be honest, like all I'm doing is indexing into index funds. Like I don't, I don't have time at the moment to like go pick stocks and, you know, I don't have time to look at crypto news and whatever's going You're on. Not staring at charts. Um, no, I'm not staring at charts. So like I've got money in real estate and we have, uh, we have some commercial stuff, but for the most part, I've got permanent insurance. It's my whole life insurance. I've got some policies there. Um, and the, the whole life situation, like you need to, you need to be able to survive three bad years of whole life to make it work. And I'm not a financial advisor, but I love whole life insurance because of, you know, it, it pays you a dividend on your cash savings and it also gives you a death benefit. And we can talk about that if you want to, but my rules for money is I want to be really good at making it really good at giving it and really good at multiplying it. Those are three separate skill sets. So making money is a skill set, giving money is a skill set, and multiplying money or investing also a skill set. And so if you can categorize your financial life that way, you'll be okay because you'll know what to study and how to study it. But that would be my my uh, you know expedient answer on that question. And what was kind of what were was there something at least as far as church life or even even with your wife? Because I know that my my wife grounds me a lot and and keeps my keeps my head level. But like when you were just coming up and like hey like it's not all about money. We're doing this for a purpose. Like this is, this is what we would like to accomplish, uh, in life in general. 
or like a support group or or was there anything like that that you kind of set up to kind of help yourself rather than just like hey i'm gonna i'm gonna fight this out myself and all and i'm strong enough type thing yeah i paid a lot of money for um my secret is always i i eat my own cooking like i pay money for mentors and coaches and people who know what they're doing because I, I don't want to spend the next 50 years like losing money to figure out how to set it up the right way. So everything that I know about trust and asset protection and estate taxes and regular taxes and whole life insurance um, and like all of these concepts, I paid someone quite a bit of money to learn it. And uh, my wife is the most generous person that I've ever met in my entire life. So she's actually like, she she'll go to church even now and she'll just give all of her money away um and and she she has never gone broke so it's like it's almost like you can't even break that you can't you almost can't break the principle like it's just going to come back in so who's to say that some of our financial blessing is not a result of her generosity i don't know but i would say that she's not the person that's like hey let's learn how to let's learn how to multiply money she's more like make more money so we can help more people out i'm like okay that sounds good you know, you're like all right i'll do it honey i'll be back <laughs> Pretty much yeah i love that um and how is um kind of going back to 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 similar to kind of what what jake was asking my question was a little bit different but how did it affect your like being how did being a christian in the business world affect how you do business at the beginning um i think i deviated a little bit because I got so gung ho about this is the this is the fastest best way to grow a business mm -hmm. now and over the past couple of years you know there's been a shift in how I how I operate my companies and how I treat people and how I treat staff and I think that the Bible is the best manuscripts uh, for self development and stewardship that exists and so I just try to do I try to follow the Bible and. The Bible has a lot of a lot of wisdom around how to treat people, how to deal with um, greedy people, how to deal with um, loyal people, how to how to like if you read Proverbs, it's basically just a business self development intensive. So that's, that's there are times, there are times, man, when like um, somebody will, you know, somebody will behave in a way that's incorrect, and I just want to sue them, and it's like no like i don't that's actually contrary to scripture and so i'm going to treat them with dignity and respect but i'm still going to remove them because i don't think that being a christian doesn't mean that you're a pushover in life and mm -hmm. you you just squander all of your money i think being successful is being biblical and being biblical is being successful and so the two create one another um so we can go into specific examples but being a Christian now defines my interactions. Like how I treat somebody on the internet is defined by scripture and how I uh, treat an employee who stole money is defined by scripture. This, it all kind of comes back down to that central tenet of um, what does the Bible say about this? And, you know, the Bible says some crazy things about how to deal with being stolen from. And it's not always fun. But that's that's what we're instructed to do. Yeah, I love that. Um, Miguel had a question. I just wanted to bring it up because he asked it a couple of times. What are the first steps that he should take into scaling his agency from one man operation to a larger team? And how do I maintain quality control during that process? Yeah, so scale, the way I define scale is is a blitzing of, of sorts around the natural um the natural constraints of physics inside of a business. So a business can grow from 1 million to 10 million, and that might not be scale for that business. Um, a business can grow from 1 million to 1.5 million, and that might be scale for that business. It depends on what is the natural stream and the natural pace and the natural speed of that business industry, et cetera. No matter what, the way that quality control is, is ensured is through quality people. Quality control comes from quality people. If you don't have quality people, you have no, there's no such thing as quality control because you're finite. Now our time is going to cap out at 15 hours a day if you're lucky. Most of us are eight hours a day. And so the only way to scale anything with safety is through hiring a great team. So you, a great um, 
you start small. If you're a one-man operation now, get an EA. Learn how to lead when the stakes in the, are low. You learn how to lead when when the when your only expense load for team is 3k a month. And then as you do that, mm -hmm. then you hire somebody else. You hire somebody else. And before you know it, um, the business is growing itself because the people are growing. My friend, um, my friend Dan Martell, I heard him say this, and I was like, I totally agree with this. He says, grow the people and the people grow the business. I don't know where he heard that. He might have made it up. He's quite prolific, but um, I'm stealing it now because I was like, that's a great line. You don't scale yeah. the business. Team scales the business. And if you can get a quality team, then you're going to have quality control as you scale. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hiring is what what is kind of one of the biggest lessons you've heard learned about hiring, just especially growing so many companies. I'm sure you've hired thousands of people. Um, what's the what's the biggest thing you either look for or that you teach for people that are hiring for you? So we hired about uh, from 2016 to 2022 uh, about 700 staff. So not okay. quite into the thousand, but close enough. And now if, if I can't see myself doing business with someone for 10 years, um, I don't want to, I don't want to even, I don't want to hire them. I think we have a short term mm -hmm. mindset when we make mistakes, it's usually short term. We're thinking really short term. We need a position filled. So we fill the position and we don't even like the person that we hired, but we need them. And then they mm -hmm. don't work out because of course they don't work out. And then we do it again. And then they don't work out because obviously they're not even a good person when well, you're hiring them. And then you do this enough time. And as a leader, you then become disenfranchised with your own leadership. You're like, I don't even trust myself anymore. I don't even believe myself anymore. You know, it'd be the equivalent of like walking out in front of a car every, every month, getting hit by the car. And then you're like doubting your own ability to be a human. Well, no shit. You're, you're making <laughs> dumb decisions that are compromising the integrity of your decision making. Like, so with yeah. people, the best, the best advice that I could give is like, can you picture yourself being with this person for 10 years? Um, and if you're like, well, I don't know. Well, then that answer is no, because you don't know. So that's the answer. So it's long-term thinking with people and then extremely quick. Um, like when somebody burns your trust, that's, a, that's it. When somebody loses, um, when somebody makes a bad decision because they were trying to make the right decision, that's okay. They can learn from that. Yeah. And you can cure them through that. But when someone burns your trust, when you no longer trust them that they have the attitude, the competency, or the experience, those are the three things we rate. Is uh, and this is all dude, like people can buy the the wealthy consultant book. And I talk a lot about team inside of that book. Like there's a whole chapter devoted to team. But attitude, competency, and experience, if they if you don't trust them on any of those three things, then it, it quick termination. Because the last thing you want to do is keep someone on your team, you hate them. They hit you. You're both bitter towards each other. That's not good for anybody. It's not good for the people. It's not good for the business. Um, so right. people's a tough one. This is a tough one. It is. Yeah. Especially always when you're dealing with people, there's going to be inconsistencies and defects and, and it's, it's tough to tough to be able to navigate around those. Um, yeah. Well, we've, <clears throat> we've hit that hour Mark Taylor and I, I really do appreciate your, your valuable time coming out here and, and answering question, my questions and the and the questions that the the, the people here had. Um, one of the things that we ask our our guests to do at the end of of every stream is, since we're primarily talking to to agency owners, you can do it in to businesses in general. Um, but one of the questions that I ask is three piece of advice. So three different piece of advice. The first piece of advice is for people that are starting from absolutely ground zero. They haven't made a dollar online, or maybe they're solo entrepreneurs, just ground zero. And then a piece of advice for people that are around, maybe like the, the mid range, just starting to hire their team on, they're making maybe like a hundred K each month MRR if they have an agency or, or, or whatever their business is. And then for a more of advanced level of people that are doing more than a million a month and they're, they're, they're really kind of pushing, pushing the boundaries on how much they're making each month. Yeah, cool. Uh, so for the first category of, of person, I would say clarity comes through movement. So um, it's really, really, really difficult to know like what you want, how to do it. Is you, you don't have any clarity if you're stuck. And indecision and analysis paralysis, these things really hit at the beginning. Um, so move and do as much as you can and keep, keep, keep trying things. 
for the second person in the middle that's looking at scale, I think the biggest piece of advice now your mistakes are that your mistakes have some consequences here at this point. At the beginning, just move, do things, mm -hmm. try things, testing. Nobody knows who you are. Nobody cares. You're not going to mess anything up. Just do stuff. In the mm -hmm. middle, you, you start having collateral damage if you make the wrong decisions. So I think here the 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 pace should slow down a little bit and getting around people like in this group and in your coaching and this environment. It sounds like you guys do a wonderful job, but get around people who can help you make the right decisions. You're you're hitting that level in the middle where it would be better to make fewer decisions but make them correctly than making more decisions and have to correct them later. At the third pillar. The the things you had to do to create the scale that you've created, um, sometimes those 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 sacrifices compromise your humanity a little bit, and you go off into. You know, I see a lot of people who are making eight figures plus, and they're kind of like um, nihilistic, and it's like they're just robotic, and they they tend to lose that piece that makes you spiritual and human. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge here is like. Just, Figure out what's fun and have some fun. And and you're mortal. You're going to wake up one day and it's your last day. I, somebody told me early on when Kate, my daughter, was born and said, one day you'll wake up and it will be the last night you take Kate to bed and carry her to bed because she won't want you to carry her to bed anymore. And you have no idea when that day is. So make sure you count all of the moments. So I was like, oh, my gosh, that's awful but great advice. It's the same with living. One day you'll, you'll wake up and it'll be the last day you got. So remind yourself to have fun and pay attention to those things. It's not all about, it's not all about advancement here in the, the monetary sense. Sometimes we advance because we had a, we just had a great year because we had a lot of fun. That's important as well. That's what I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Well, thank you for your time, Taylor. Really appreciate it. Um, I know it's very valuable, so I appreciate you coming in and dedicating this hour to everyone here. Hey, thanks for having me. See you guys. Bye. All righty, my man. All righty, guys. Thank you for coming out today. We really appreciate your time. I hope that was uh, valuable to you. I hope you got all your questions answered. Uh, you know where where to find him if you'd like to. I think his, well, his handle on uh, on Twitter is Taylor A. Welsh. Um, and then I'm, I'm it's probably going to be the same on Instagram and everywhere else. Um, but if you just search, search Taylor Welsh, you'll find him up, um, and consume his content. He has really good stuff, read his books. All of it's very good. Um, so really appreciate you guys coming out today. Once again, many of you will watch, but very few of you will actually listen.